Big Questions with the Dead Milkmen. Greetings, Gherkins, and welcome to Big Questions with the Dead Milkmen. Hey, did you know that in 1855, a brawl between circus clowns and firefighters erupted into a full-scale riot? Well, it did. And to the best of my knowledge, no one has ever written a song about it. Which brings us to tonight's to tonight's uh, big or this week's topic, uh, which is uh, which weird fact or strange historical event would make good fodder for a song. Okay, I will start this off, and my my weird fact is graham crackers were invented to keep our ancestors from masturbating. D- did you fellows know about this? First of all. No, I did not. Masturbating? From masturbating. Are you fellas interested? No, I'm, in my, I'm, 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 I'm intrigued at this point. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. See, now, now you got to know, don't you? Um, although everybody who's watching it has has changed the, the channel um, or flipped over to another thing. Yeah, they were actually created by Sylvester Graham, which is like finding out that the synthesizer was created by Sylvester Synthesizer. Mm-hmm. But Graham crackers were invented by Sylvester Graham. Uh, he, was, he was a minister in the 1800s. And he believed that eating and drinking delicious foods, which included meat, coffee, spices, well, these sort of things would stimulate your urges. And that would lead to masturbation. And um, so he developed a brittle, flavorless cracker that could help suppress sexual desire, particularly in adolescent boys. So ladies, um, you are still free to... uh... No. um, I think it's fascinating because uh, s'mores, (coughs) the main ingredient in uh, in s'mores is graham crackers. And s'mores are the most erotic food on the planet. S'mores are really, and s'mores were invented by the Boy Scouts in 1925. I didn't have to look that fact up. I've just known it for years. So what I'm going to suggest I want to do with my song is I'm going to call my song, Billy, Don't Have Another Stroke Tonight. Because stroke can mean a couple different things. And the titular Billy is, in fact, Billy Squire who went to the top of the charts with the stroke. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, the stroke, yeah, a song that kicked off the punk rock revolution. So my song would be like, Billy, don't have another stroke tonight. Eat these graham crackers and everything will be all right. We've got a dozen boxes up there on the shelf. So try these graham crackers and please don't touch yourself. So yes, that is my fact for tonight. Now I had, I had, I had visual aids. I had a prop, which was a, uh, um, a box of graham crackers. Um, but I don't have them now because I decided to feed the graham crackers to the birds. Uh, but on the plus side, I haven't seen the birds masturbating. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that's my, uh, by the way, Mr. Kellogg, you know, Kellogg's Corn Flakes, that guy was a follower of Mr. Graham. Uh, and so oh, he actually. Oh, Seventh-day Adventist. Yeah, he, he, well, yeah, he invented, to, um, he invented the same thing with Corn Flakes. He thought Corn Flakes we keep people from masturbating. For me, it's rice cakes. They left, <laughs> they left cornmeal out overnight, and it got stale. And they were like, hey, let's put this in cereal. Let's make it a cereal. If I left any food substance out overnight, my wife would make me sleep on the couch for eternity. <laughs> he turned it around. He was like, no, I did this on purpose. It's a delicious cereal now. I meant to do that. He pee me her. <laughs> All right. Joe, what food keeps you from anyway? <laughs> I think Joe is next. This is about food. Well, no, it's not about food. It's just, didn't you hear the question? I'll repeat yeah, it. I thought it was, yes, I thought it was anything. which beer well, fact or strange historical that. event would make good butter? Oh, so the invention of the Graham. Okay. Yeah, so this that's is about my weird, my, weird historical fact is Graham crackers were invented. Yeah. Historical fact, historical event, fact, event. Um, my event happened in, I think, 1896. Um, it's known now as the Great Crash, or was known as, as the Great Crash at Crush. Um, <clears throat> this guy named William George Crush, who was a passenger agent for the Missouri-Kansas-Texas Railroad, <laughs> better known as the Katy Line, K-A-T-Y, <laughs> um, had an idea to promote ridership on the Katy line. And uh, it 
he did it. it well, his idea was to take take two locomotives and face them in to each other and have them crash <laughs> and sell basically sell <laughs> the event to spectators. And the way he sold it was that anywhere on the Katy line, you could get a <laughs> ticket to this new temporary town that he created near Waco and named it after himself, Crush, Crush, Texas. Um, he built the town expecting about 20,000 people to be there. So I guess it was like a, a place for the people they could stay overnight and eat. And there was also a jail built and he hired 200 constables to keep the peace in the town. Like so he's a festival. It was an it was a widely successful event because he sold he was expecting twenty thousand he sold forty thousand tickets and they had forty thousand spectators. Come the idea the the, the trains, uh, they built it wasn't on the Katy line they built a special rail uh, line for this crash to happen. In what in a gully it was like a natural amphitheater for the crash to happen the trains were set far enough apart where they would get up to 50 miles per hour before they collided the engineer and they were i think uh mr crush dropped his hat in the middle and that's how they that's how they knew to start and then the engineers would leap off of course before the collision happened but <laughs> uh so it was a, a successful promotion but as some of the naysayers predicted, the boilers on both the locomotives exploded on impact and sent shrapnel and timber into the air, and three people were killed from that, <laughs> three of the spectators. So, And it made up news all over the nation back then, but I think it's kind of forgotten now. It's in You can read about it in Atlas Obscura and other places, Wikipedia. <laughs> it's one of my favorite disasters. I love disasters, and I love that because there are places where you can find how far different parts of the trains went, and you know, like how much they weighed, and and stuff would weigh like nearly a ton, and they would find it like you know seven or eight hundred feet away from the crash site. So the and end part, part of the justification was it was also scientific but it wasn't really scientific so the engineers had to jump off a yeah. train that was traveling at 50 miles an hour yeah that that was a dangerous <laughs> thing in itself they weren't killed no. <laughs> a photographer got his eye knocked out yeah ironically i guess from one of the shrapnel <laughs> you only need one eye really to be a photographer <laughs> okay does the, does the town of crush still exist it does not it was a temporary town as far as i know I looked it up in Wikipedia. It doesn't seem to exist. It was it's built like, just for this event. They should have known better. Like, they're tempting fate. Remember, like, Camp Kids on Fire? The one from the movie Jesus Camp? Yeah. Why would you call it Camp Kids on Fire? You're when they call the town Crusher. Crush. You're going to put well, your... Well, it was named after him. Off. And I guess he wanted to call it the collision at cr or the crash at Crush. <laughs> the town actually was the third largest city in texas i think it was That's for that night for the night of the event only <laughs> because they had forty thousand people there. you know I, I honestly i think in the context it's not that surprising that that many people they didn't have tv they had nothing they had nothing like nobody ever yeah. saw like the that. cinema didn't come quite yet yeah. so I, I would go to coachella if they would ram two trains together. Like, next time we're stuck for an opening act, let's ram two trains Well, together. it wasn't even the first time or the last time that yeah. trains collided, that they, they staged collisions for spectators. So I guess it was like the demolition derby or something. Monster truck. Monster truck rally. Of its age. <laughs> like playing chicken, but you can't swerve. You know what I mean? And on a track. Oh, so, yeah. The song could be the great crush collision. And in fact, Scott Joplin composed a piece called "The Great Crush Collision March" at the time. Uh oh! But it, I don't, I don't, I think it's only instrumental. I, don't, I haven't heard of any words to it. But you could. They just probably, probably sampled screams and put them. Over. Sample <laughs> that and make a rap song out of it. Your answer yeah. is disqualified, Joe. Am I disqualified? There's already yeah. a song about it. A, a song has to have lyrics. To be a song. Okay. So what? A song without lyrics is not a song. <laughs> That sounds like a title of a song. 
Yeah, actually, yeah, it's a good question because somebody did make a song about. It. Well, we don't know. I don't know if anybody ever made a song about. I I checked and I didn't see anything. That wasn't part be. of the criteria, though. Yeah, some somebody must have made a song it's about still song fodder. Yeah, it's true. We said what would be good fodder. We didn't say that you couldn't. That nobody ever had to make. I'm changing my answer to the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. <laughs> and then the chime what? rang twenty nine times. Oh man, I just thought of one. Uh, Tony Bono hitting a tree. <laughs> the first instance of the sap going into the tree. Yes. <laughs> All right, who's next? Uh, wait, Joe, are you done with your, your Yes, drink? I'm done. I'm yes. done. Your horrifying tale. Of I'm done. Okay, so for those of you keeping score at home, uh, it's masturbation and uh, train disasters. Uh, I think, Dan, you're next. Uh, well, so, so to find my, there's so many weird things that have happened, right? So in order to, to, to refine my search, I was like, all right, what's the date we're doing this? And I, so I took December 1st <laughs> and I found a whole bunch of weird or just any events that happened. Um, and I don't know why, but I got stuck on this one that wasn't that weird. But as I looked at it, I realized, wow, there is some weird stuff about it. So it was uh, December 1st, 1958 in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, a school that was called Our Lady of the Angels caught on fire and 92 pupils and three nuns were killed. Now, that is not, uh, that's not a small number of pupils. Um, this, there, this fire is like a textbook, like fire safety, uh, like what to avoid and, you know, fire not being safe um they had one fire escape uh they all the kids or there was no smoke alarms um this is before sprinkler systems everything that we have like and maybe maybe it's stuck with me because like uh, the last like 10 years my jobs have all been like <clears throat> being responsible for a building somehow like maintenance or whatever so like I learn about this stuff and I see all the fire safety stuff. And now it makes so much sense reading this story. It's terrible. It's just one thing after the other. It was like people just kept doing like the wrong thing. Like, oh, open the transom windows, which actually caused more air to come in, burn. Uh, and then they were like, okay, everybody into this classroom. And it was like, no, people were jumping out of the second floor window, but there was a raised basement. So the second floor was like the third floor. The so people died jumping out. It's just awful, awful. So I'm reading this and I'm like, ah, uh, I don't know if I should make this my answer. <laughs> and then at the very bottom, I was like, wait a second. The keyboardist and guitar player for Journey was a survivor of this fire. What? But what year was this? 1958. Oh, 1958. Okay. Said he was. I think he said he was eight years old. So, yeah. Um, Explains wheel in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Don't stop believing. Yeah, yeah. When the lights go down. <laughs> the you know what? It, the other the other part of it that I liked is that the name of it lends itself to a song title. Yeah. Our Lady of the Angels, and it's about a bunch of kids that burned. Like. Yeah, again, it's like Crush Texas or Camp Kids on Fire. <laughs> also, I'm not surprised because nuns are extremely flammable. Um, <laughs> there's that whole thing about spontaneous ecclesiastical combustion. No, a nun will go up. You cannot put... That's why they don't let them smoke anymore. You cannot <laughs> let... Don't even vape with a nun because they will burst into flame. But yeah, the, another problem was that they would have sometimes 64 kids in a classroom. I think this is, uh, there's so many things about this that probably caused so many regulations to come from it. Like, I don't know, nowadays you don't have more than like 25 kids in a classroom usually. Well, ideally. <laughs> yeah. There's, and you know, one fire escape on a two story building. Um, I don't. It's. It was really. Uh, I, I actually had trouble falling asleep that night after I read about it. It was very, kind of disturbing. So it's not like a, it's not the weirdest thing, but that the journey keyboard is guitar player thing. Added. I liked it. Yeah, I thought it was good. Nice you know, Charles Nelson Riley survived a circus fire. Wow. 
Yeah, the big circus fire in Hartford, Connecticut in the 1930s. Charles Nelson Riley was a survivor of that. Interesting. No, we're not as good as the as as a camp burning angels, but her school of the burning angels. School of the burning angels would be that's what I would call that song. Angel fire. Angel fire. <laughs> all okay, right. so all right, okay. keeping score, it's masturbation, uh, horrible train wrecks, and burning school kids. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, so like Dan, I tried to put some uh, 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 limitations on my search for a weird event or fact, and I went looking for something uh, right here in Pennsylvania, and I found this. Have you all heard of the Donora smog of 1948? No. Okay, to add to the creepiness of this story, this event lasted for five days and happened right before Halloween in 1948. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, the event killed 20 people and caused respiratory problems for almost half of the 14,000 people uh, of living in this town. Um, this town, by the way, is a small um, mill town that's about uh, 25 miles southeast of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And 60 years later, it was described as one of the worst air pollution disasters in U.S. history. And the cause was hydrogen fluoride and sulfur dioxide emissions from the U.S. Steel um, Donora Zinc Works and its American Steel and Wire Plant. These releases were frequent occurrences in Donora. But what made the 1948 uh, incident so severe was a weird um, uh, weather event called a temperature inversion. And that means when warmer air is on top, it traps the uh, cooler air on the bottom. And so the pollution along with the cooler air, the fog was trapped below that and it lasted for five days in this town. Um, they formed a thick yellowish acrid smog. Um, and it had sulfuric acid, uh, nitrogen dioxide, fluorine, and other poisonous gases, um, which, you know, were usually just dispersed into the air like nothing, uh, you know, happened, you know, no, no cares in the world. And it, it didn't end until it started to rain on Halloween day, okay? Um, the emissions killed almost all vegetation within a half mile radius of the zinc plant. Um, and it was determined later that it was the fluorine gas um, generated by the zinc smelting process um, that was trapped by the stagnant air was the primary cause of death. And uh, autopsy results of the people who died saw uh, fluorine levels in the, these bodies like 20 times higher than normal. And the weird thing is now that there's a museum in the town that you could go to and like learn all about the event. Okay. And so it was a weird kind of thing. They, nobody really talked about it for a long time until about 50 years later, somebody decided to elect or erect a plaque uh, noting this weird event. And then the town is kind of um, uh, identified with it. And, you know, they have this museum. Another weird thing about this town is, is that, um, they have, I guess, the, the steel plant um, provided housing for the workers, and they wanted to provide housing, and they, they have a whole section of town called Concrete Town, where all the houses are made of concrete, and Thomas Edison was one of the designers of these houses. Um, just so you know, uh, the, uh, the U.S. Steel, of course, denied responsibility, calling it an act of God, and they only gave them like a token amount of settlement money. Um, and both of these plants closed down in 1966. And of course, it became yet another sleepy uh, Rust Belt town that we have lots of here in Pennsylvania. So I thought that was a very kind of unusual event. Yeah, Thomas. Uh, I have pictures, 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 on pictures online, on and there's uh, there's some there's some videos about it on YouTube. We'll provide links to all that. Yeah, Thomas Edison was really into the concrete houses. If you go on a little on a little trip around the web, you'll find what those things look like. So yeah, Joe and I are, as you know, are from a steel town. My father worked in a steel mill. We probably inhaled things. We would probably be like 
easily 5'11", both of us, and we had not grown up in, in a steel town. Man, that's I never heard about that. And, I'm, and there was a whole bunch of weird gaseous stuff mm. that sounds odd taking place. I got I and I hope that museum has a gift shop. Because right there, that right, that's that's shopping for everybody, right? Um, <laughs> one stop shopping. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. I really enjoyed those. Um, and um, um, thank you also. Nobody mentioned Rasputin's daughter, Rasputin's daughter, uh, which is what everybody always does when they talk about weird facts. And they go, you know, that uh, whole disclaimer, you know, not based on any person living or dead. Well, that's because Rasputin's daughter sued, and that's the one that usually comes up in these. And we avoided it. We went for the deadly stuff. And and masturbation. So I feel good about that. All right. So it is time for recommendations. Um, I'm not going to do tonight music that you won't hear on the radio or see on TV because I actually have heard this band on TV. Uh, this is, I, I want to tell everybody, just go back. Um, I was listening to a podcast a few weeks ago and they went back and they sort of re-reviewed and re-listened to and talked about Rasputina's 1996 album, Thanks for the Ether. <clears throat> And this is a great album. It's an album I listen to. I, I, I probably sit down and listen to the whole thing through maybe once or twice a year. Um, it's really informed a lot of my thinking about what albums should sound like. I like albums that sound as if somebody did performance art. Um, it, it's, it should have wiped out everything. People talk to me now like, I'm, I'm getting my kids into punk rock and I'm playing them the Ramones and stuff like that. And they go, you know what? Just start at Thanks for the Ether and forget every goddamn thing that came before it. Um, it it's, it's weird that this album was on a major label. Columbia put this out. It's uh, For those who don't know about Rasputina, this is, uh, well, it, on the album, it's two women, although they made up a third, uh, who play cello and do these incredible songs. And uh, and the very first song, fitting in with tonight's theme, uh, is called My Little Shirtwaist Fire. And it's about the 1911 Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. And when I first heard it, I thought, Oh my God, somebody else knows about this because you can ask the other guys. We've, we've been out there on the road and we've met musicians who people think are smart and they never are. So to actually encounter smart musicians is such a joy. People go, I bet he's really an intelligent guy and he should run for president. You go, no, no, we've met him. And, and if, if he can tie his shoes, we'll be amazed. But Rasputin or actually the fact that they would put out a major label release, there's a, there's a little spoken word piece on it called the Donner Party, which is all about all of America's earlier settlers all being cannibals. The pilgrims, everybody. Because what does settler mean other than to settle? For human flesh. So it's, it's absolutely fantastic. It's the future we could have had. I'm always fascinated by the future we could have had. Uh, you know, if, if uh, um, people had bought the Velvet Underground's album instead of Sgt. Pepper, we could have had a great future. If Mommy's Little Monster had outsold Thriller, we could have had a great future. Um, if uh, um, I would say if uh, um, uh, oh, um, Retro by um, Mind in a Box. That's that's the synth wave that we should have instead of the people who watch Stranger Things and then made synth wave. But this is this is what we could have had, and we reached a point, and instead of getting this, this exciting new music made by people with cellos and people going off and doing weird things, we got Weezer. So just, just please, people, if you've never listened to this album, particularly if you're a musician, please go give it like a thousand spin through, because it is, it is really, I always tell people, this is really where punk rock starts. When we were sitting around listening to like, you know, the, um, you know, like the, uh, the Minutemen and, and, and the Meat Puppets and stuff like that, this is what we were waiting for. We were waiting for somebody to make this album. It's that good. Um, and we'll put a link in, by the way, to the, uh, um, to the podcast where they were discussing it. All right, next, uh, a movie recommendation. Over the holidays, I got to see a bunch of movies. I got to see the delightful coming-of-age film, Pearl. Oh, it touched my heart. Um, I also got to see the heartwarming rom-com, uh, Barbarian. <laughs> I think it's going to work out for those kids. But the film I really liked is Wes Anderson's new film, Terrifier 2. <laughs> oh, my God. It's, it's Normally, I'm not a Wes Anderson guy and the idea of two and a half hours of Wes Anderson. But Terrifier 2 is amazing. Bill Murray as Art the Clown. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> also, there's a rave scene where they where they play Pain uh, by Boy Harsher. So it's, I think that's going to be the, the go to from now on. And like if there's a dancing scene, there'll be Pain by Boy Harsher. But uh, and one of our one of our side projects almost had a chance to be on the soundtrack. And that person is really depressed that they weren't. So, um, yeah, I'm going to recommend if even if you don't like Wes Anderson, Terrifier 2, darn good movie. It is indeed a movie. All right, so thank you very much.
I recommend a documentary series <laughs> called On the Rails. It's like a little travelogue <laughs> uh, where you get to travel by train with the host Oliver Weber. Um, it's dubbed in English. I think it was originally French, but it's still it's part of the entertaining <laughs> quality of it that you get to hear dubbing. Um, I watched so far three of them, and I'm on the fourth one, and it's a uh, five five part series, five uh, episodes. So you get to go by train all around, and the first uh, episode is. Martinia in North Africa. That's fascinating. The trains are pretty colorful and cool. Sicily in Italy. Another great episode. Uh, some of the passengers. He talks to passengers too. And they talk about the mafia and other things about Sicily. <laughs> um, Mexico. Colorful trains that are great, great uh, scenery. And I'm halfway through USA where you get to see Amtrak in action. <laughs> <laughs> And then the Czech Republic is one I haven't seen yet, but I recommend it. Sorry for taking so much time, but I would watch. So I would definitely watch that. If you like trains, and it's on Curiosity Stream. Oh, I like Um, <clears throat> I would like to recommend uh, at least watching the Kiko Man. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, whether it's official or not, the commercial for Kiko Man. You can have the soy sauce if you'd like, but you got to watch this. And this was, we were talking about this at band practice the other night because I was, Rodney and I at least were, were heavily impacted by this maybe 20 years ago. I think it was about 2002 when I first saw it. Yeah. Um, man, uh, what, what could you say about it? I think we're just going to bring. All you can say is all other sauces are wimps. <laughs> so, folks, the reason we were talking about this was because I was watching our uh, – I have a little app that, for this show, and I saw that we went over 5,000 viewers. And so I was going to send a thing out to everybody that said I was, it was going to be over 9,000, but then that was going to be crossed out, and it said, like, over 5,000. And I thought, does anybody remember over 9,000? So we were talking about it in practice. We started talking about all these old memes and stuff. And I started talking about when Oprah encountered over 9,000. And uh, so, yeah, we were just talking about, like, old memes like that, like, all your base are belong to us. And we were wondering, like, who either remembers them or were they just, like, there and, and gone? So, yeah. But Kiko Man is probably the best. Kiko Man... Transcends time. Yeah, Kiko Man is the Tony Stark of the of the <laughs> Avengers that are the memes. Okay, um, for my recommendation, I would like to recommend an artist who has a website, MaryStreepy.com. She's an artist based in Austin, Texas, and she's a friend of ours and a friend of our friends in Austin. And uh, I just bought a painting from her. Um, to give to Melissa for Christmas. So my wife, so don't tell her, but I'm going to show you what it is. Um, this is a painting that I bought from her. She's a wonderful artist and she sells her work through Etsy and you can go on her website and you can see lots of her work. And I suggest you support the arts and buy a painting from Mary Streepy. Uh, they're, they're very reasonably priced and uh, you're going to be very pleased with what you get in the mail. Thank you. Yep. Another fun fact, the CIA used to fund Jackson Pollock uh, because communists hated abstract art. <laughs> Stalin hated abstract art. He said the workers didn't understand it. We're filled with, why are there no, well, actually there was a, a Camper Van Beethoven song called We the Workers Do Not Understand Modern Art. So yeah, some, someone finally beat us to something. <laughs> um, but really, didn't Camper Van Beethoven just take our act? <laughs> Some people might say yeah. So, um, all right. Well, um, I had something I wanted to talk about, and I can't remember what the hell it was. So maybe we should get out of here. We are running out of time. We've got we've got five minutes left. You guys been following the whole cryptocurrency scandal with the with the girl who was the LARPer? No, not that. Oh, okay. So there's there's big cryptocurrency scandal, and uh, um, basically a lot of money went missing. And the CEO of the company was a young lady who showed up for her sort of job interview as CEO, dressed as a wood sprite. 
because she'd just come from a LARPing party. <laughs> and, <laughs> and literally, uh, me and a bunch of other people can't stop talking about this. I asked my boss today if I could come in dressed like a wood sprite. <laughs> It's if you get a chance, look into the whole the whole thing. Um, it's yeah, it's it's really hilarious. But it's uh, um, yeah, it's it's my favorite new sort of weird, weird news story. I mean, I you know I didn't invest in there. I didn't lose any money. I don't know. We might have to cut some of this because I work for a financial firm, but I'm not giving financial advice. So we'll probably be OK here. So. Well, hey, maybe someday someone will write a song about it. They probably will. I mean, it, it gets weirder and weirder. Like apparently they lived in a pod with 10 other people that they were all polyamorous with. And she she tweeted, I think, while on amphetamines. Like, it's great to be on amphetamines. And I'm like, and nowhere when I was playing Dungeons and Dragons did any of the elves ever do amphetamines. <laughs> Are you people plagued by elves, fairies, and wood sprites? You want to you want to come to us? We have a cure. All right. Uh, wow, well, we've got like three minutes. So we uh, everybody just split early. Well, it's going to air on Saturday. We're playing a show in, in the Philadelphia area at the Art and Music Hall on Sunday. So maybe we can please <laughs> some of you yeah. ask, see some of you uh, on Sunday. Yeah, we're playing Ardmore because we're pretty much banned from everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and we used to call it Hardmore because that's what FOD called it. So yeah, come on out. Uh, oh, oh, how many opening acts do we have? One or two? One. We only your, get the your, opening, friend, your friends are opening. Yeah, opening act. Those troublemakers, come on out. You're actually you're going to love this band. They are they're as cute as a bug's ear and as ornery as a bug on amphetamine. <laughs> All, right. All right, I'm out of here. Bye. I'm signing off first this time.